Hello guys. Today we are uh, cont continuing the next part of the last class. Yesterday we were discussing the chapter present Samidars and the state. In the last video, we covered on covered all of the main points. I mean, we talked about which are the main points and what will be what are coming under the topics and all. Today we will start the first point, first topic actually. its peasants and agricultural production while studying about the india or any community of that time we have to study about the peasants and agricultural society and how they pro produced and we said the agriculture production was the backbone of the society so it's very important to study about what what were happening then at all peasants and agricultural production The basic unit of agricultural society was the village, inhabited by peasants who performed the manifold seasonal tasks. The basic unit of agricultural society was village. It's obvious. Uh, last day we talked about almost eighty-five percentage of the population in, inhabited in villages. Several kinds of areas, such as large tracts of dry land or hilly regions, were not cultivable. Moreover, forest areas made up a substantial portion proportion of territory. In that, uh, large tracts of land, uh, dry land or hilly regions were not cult cultivable, and forest areas are, of course, they are not cultivable. The major sources for the agrarian history of the 16th and early 17th centuries are chronicles and documents from the Mughal court. Any Akbari of Akbar's court meticulously recorded the arrangements made by the state. It's about sources. Some other sources are detailed revenue. Uh, some other sources are detailed revenue records from Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Rajasthan dating from the 17th and 18th centuries. Besides, the extensive records of the East India Company provide us the useful descriptions of agrarian relations in Eastern India. All these uh, sources record instances of conflicts between peasants, samindars, and the state. in the process they give us an insight into peasants perception of their expectations and expectations of fairness from the state okay it's there's nothing to detail or explain now peasants and their land the terms most frequently used to denote a peasant were rayat plural raya or muzarian kisan or asami now we are using this word kisan and all <coughs> even now we are using kisan the next point there is a reference of two kinds of peasants in the 17th century kutkarsta and pahirsta in the 18th century the peasants were classified into two there is kutkarsta they were residents of village in which they held their lands and pahirsta they were non resident cultivators who cultivated lands elsewhere on a contractual basis Kutkarsta, the people, the farmers known as Kutkarsta, are their own land, and the Pahikarsta were cultivated on land on some contract basis. An average presence of North India did not possess more than a pair of bullocks and two ploughs. Most of them possessed even less. They were in a such a pity condition. In Gujarat, peasants possessing about six acres of land were considered as to be affluent. In Bengal, on the other hand, five acres was the upper limit of an average peasant farm. It shows all over the country to us not the same. In Gujarat, if someone has six acres of land, they they were considered to be affluent. In Bengal, one on other hand, five acres was the upper limit of an average person for. Look the different. Cultivation was based on the principle of individual ownership. Peasants bought and sold their lands like the like other property owners. They decided when to sell, when to buy, and all. the abundance of land available lab, available labor and mobility of peasants was three factors that accounted for the constant expansion of agriculture the three factors account for the constant expansion of agriculture were the abundance of land availability of labor and the mobility of peasants then the irrigation how they irrigated the cultivation of course the farmer needs proper irrigation to make the make a better crop now let's look into how they irrigated monsoons remain the backbone of indian agriculture as they are even today yeah of course monsoon are the backbone of indian agriculture even now then also it was the same but there were crops which required additional water 
artificial systems of irrigation had to be devised for this. Irrigation projects received state support as well. Though agriculture was labor intensive, peasants reduced technologies that often harnessed cattle energy. Agriculture was labor intensive and uh, peasants used the energy of cattle. Agriculture was organized around two major season cycles the Karif and Rabi. Karif is autumn and Rabi is spring. During the 17th century, several new crops from different parts of the world reached the Indian subcontinent. In the 17th century, new crops reached the Indian subcontinent. For example, maize. Maize was known as Makkah. Was introduced into India by Africa and Spain, which gradually became one of the major crops of Western India. Vegetables like tomatoes, potatoes and chilies were introduced from the new world at its time. As were fruits like pineapple and papaya. The village community. It's a nice topic um, for us to uh, take a look again. Under the topic peasants and agriculture production, we said about uh, there were some areas where not cultivable, like forest and hilly tracks and dry land. Then from where we get the idea about the, source for the sources. And Gujarat, Maharashtra, Rajasthan records and all. Then extensive records of East India Company and conflict between peasants and Samindars and all. And the peasants and their land, how they owned land, the availability of land, what they known as Kisan, Ruyat, those times. And the division of Kutkasta and Bahigasta, the people who owned land were Kutkasta and people cultivated on a contractual basis were Bahigasta. Then we talk about the Kind of individual ownership and uh, somewhere prop they used to sell and all then how they irrigated the irrigations the monsoon remained as the backbone of Indian agriculture as today and the energy it was of course was a cattle energy they use for agriculture and the two main seasons of agriculture then the crops from where these crops arrived and all now the village community the village community. Apart from individual ownership, lands belong to a collective village community as far as many aspects of their social existence were concerned. There were three constituent constituents on this community. The cultivators, the panchayat, and the village headman. Village headman were known as Mukadam or Mandal. And distinctions. Keep deep inequalities on the basis of caste and other caste-like distinctions mean that the cultivators were a highly heterogeneous group. Like, despite the abundance of cultivable land, certain caste groups were assigned menial tasks. One who tilled the land was known as menials or agricultural labourers. In Hindi, Majur. In their language, it was Majur. In Muslim communities, menials like Halakoran, they were scavengers, were housed outside the boundaries of village. The deep inequalities were based on caste and caste like systems were existed then. There was a direct correlation between caste, poverty and social status at the lower strata of society. There was a direct correlation between caste, poverty and social status in the lower strata of society. In a manual, in a manual from 17th century Marwar, Rajasvits mentioned as peasants, sharing the same space with Jats, who were accorded a lower status in the caste Hierarchy. Castles such as Agirs, Gujars and Malis rose in hierarchy because of the profitability of cattle rearing and horticulture. Then, the headman. The village panchayat was assembly of elders headed by a headman known as Mukadam or Mandal. The village panchayat was an assembly of elders. The headman or the guy who heads the village assembly, village panchayat known as Mukadam or Mandal. The headman held office as long as enjoyed the conference of the village and place. Failing which they could be dismissed by them. The Panjas derived its funds from contributions made by the individuals to a common financial pool. One important function of the Panjas was to ensure that caste boundaries among the various communities inhabiting the village were upheld. Panjas also had the authority of levy fines and inflict more serious forms of punishment like extraction from the community. Panjas, there were some powers of Panjas like they had the authority to levy fines and to give serious punishments like expulsions even. In addition to the village panchayat, each caste or jadi in a village had its own jadi panchayat also. Then there were, there were other class where village artisans. The distinction between artisans and peasants in village society was a fluid one. As many groups performed the task of both. 
It was fluid because many groups, many cast, many people do artisanal works. Cultivators and their families would also participate in craft production, such as dyeing, textile printing, baking and baking and firing of pottery, making and repairing agricultural implements. Cultivators and their family also participate in these works. Village artisans, potters, blacksmiths, carpenters, barbers, even goldsmiths provide a specialized service in return for which they were compensated by villagers by a variety of means, mostly by giving them a share of the harvest or an allotment of land. Money was not common, mostly by giving they received a share of harvest or an allotment of land instead of these works, on return of these works. Some British officials in the 19th century saw the village as a little republic. It's a question, what is a little republic? Some British officials in the 19th century saw the village as a little republic, made up of a fraternal party sharing resources and labor in a collective. But this was not a sign of rural irregularity because, <coughs> rural, sorry, but this was not a sign of rural egalitarianism because these there existed deep inequalities based on caste and gender distinctions. Uh, we will talk about what were the caste and gender distinctions and all in the next topic, women and agrarian society. Now that's all for today.